The court now will take up the second case on our docket, Suzuki Motor Corporation versus Winkler. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Raul Cantero on behalf of Suzuki Motor Corporation. I'm reserving five minutes for rebuttal. The issue in this case is whether in a products liability case against Suzuki pending in Jacksonville, Florida, the plaintiff may examine the chairman and former CEO of Suzuki in Japan, uh, who has no knowledge of, these, of the case or the circumstances leading up to it. We submit that regardless of whether this court adopts the apex doctrine, it should quash the first DCA's decision and hold that there was no evidence that the examination of the chairman uh, would be likely to lead to the discovery of relevant evidence. Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could I ask you about this declaration? Um, it seems like, you know, it obviously is a matter of common sense. I can't imagine that Mr. Suzuki knows anything about this particular accident. And the declaration is very clear that he doesn't remember anything about this document that was shown to him. But the declaration doesn't say that he doesn't know anything about sort of the overall recall decision with this, because obviously this issue with the product was had more it had to do with more than just this one accident. Um, so, I, you know, what are we to make of that? I mean, this it does seem like there's a difference between this case and these insurance cases where it's very much focused on you know the one dispute and the high level official says I have not I have know nothing about this coverage dispute or whatever. It seems like here it's it would be plausible to think that Mr. Suzuki, regardless of whether he had authority to make the recall decision or anything like that, it does seem plausible that he might have information that could lead to admissible evidence as to just the overall sort of corporate decision making on this on this issue in a broader sense. And it doesn't seem like the declaration precludes that. Your Honor, the, we need to look not only at the declaration, that's certainly one thing, but also Mr. Uh, Kudo, um, who was with uh, Suzuki Motors America, was deposed in this case over a period of three days. And he testified, and, and his deposition is in the record, um, and that what the relevant parts are at uh, RA, Respondents Appendix 557 to 571, and he testified that the only entity that can make a decision on recall was the uh, the Quality Countermeasures Committee. That Mr. Suzuki was not on that committee. He had no authority on the committee. He could not override or veto on the committee, um, and that it was the chairman of the committee who ultimately makes the decision. Mr. Kudo was involved in the investigation. Um, and in fact, um, plaintiffs introduced an expert um, and that expert affidavit attached um, 23 different exhibits to the affidavit. And that you can find at um, Respondents Appendix 221 to 394. So 170 different pages of documents in those exhibits are emails either from Kudo or to Kudo. He was intimately involved. The expert identifies Kudo as having made a cost benefit analysis. And that's at uh, Respondent Appendix 358 to, to 61, where he has like pros and cons of issuing a recall. Mr. Kudo was intimately involved with the decision, as you can see from those exhibits. In addition, during the pendency of the petition in the first DCA, they deposed the corporate representative for Suzuki Motor Corporation. I say deposed as they deposed them, yes, as corporate representative in Japan, again, over a period of three days, who corroborated what Mr. Kudo said about the authority of the Quality Countermeasures Committee and about the lack of authority of the uh, chairman to be involved in recall decisions. In fact, they testified that it was a, a policy of the company uh, to kind of uh, cabin off the chairman from any decision about the recall so that the committee is completely independent and can decide on its own 
whether to issue a recall without any veto or involvement of the chairman. So yes, there is the declaration. And he says, he, in fact, in his declaration, he says, I would have no authority to override, reject, or even order a field action or recall. Um, so, well, we so, have, that goes to, so that, but all of everything you just said, it, I mean, it goes to the authority to make the decisions as opposed to just knowledge about how the company decided to, to, to handle this. So can I ask you a question though about the standard of review? So the departure from the essential requirements of law, um, you agree and you concede in the briefs that there is no existing sort of black letter apex doctrine that Florida court, it's obviously nothing on the, in the face of the rules themselves. And as far as case law, there's no sort of black letter rule that would apply an apex doctrine in the corporate context at this point, if we just take the law as it stood at the time that this court was having to decide this, is that, that's right, right? Yes. Okay, so then does that leave you with sort of an abuse of discretion argument? I mean, how do you get to the departure from the- I, I think, well, this is how I get there, Your Honor. And um, let me just uh, talk a little bit about two cases from this court. The first is Martin Johnson versus Savage, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which even back then in 1987 said that discovery orders have been traditionally reviewed by certiorari. So even 33 years ago, this court considered it a tradition that discovery orders were reviewed by certiorari. Second, 1995, Allstate versus Langston uh, quashed a district court order. And, and I want to quote what it said. Uh, it quashed the district court's opinion, quote, to the extent that it permits discovery, even where it has been affirmatively established that such discovery is neither relevant nor will lead to the discovery of relevant information. Um, subsequently, other district courts of appeal have taken up that language and have held in discovery orders uh, where there is no extant law, no case on point, but we do have the rules of procedure, which also are established law. As courts have said, it's not just a case on point. It could be a rule on point. And district courts have reversed uh, discovery orders where the, the, um, the discovery was not reasonably likely to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. When that happens, then the, uh, there is a departure from the essential requirements of law. Basically, particular, because under, under the circumstances, you would say that there's, it seems so unlikely that it would, or it's so clearly shown that it, that the deposition or whatever the discovery wouldn't lead to the discovery of admissible evidence, that it's an abuse of discretion not to enter the protective order. I mean, isn't that essentially what the court would be concluding? Yes, except I think couched in the language of a departure from the essential requirements of law, which courts have equated in the discovery context, abuse of discretion with such a departure. And there have been cases that, that have done that in this very context. In fact, as I'm sure you know, we cited General Starr versus Atlantic Hospitality from the third DCA, which also quashed in the corporate context. And I think you referred to it earlier, Justice Muniz, in, in terms of the insurance context where the president was set to be deposed. He had no knowledge of the case. The third DCA quashed that order because there, it was not reasonably likely to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So it did so without adopting the Apex Doctrine. It said, we don't have to uh, issue so broad a ruling in this case when we can simply apply the rule. And in terms of though, but in terms of what's at issue substantively in this lawsuit, isn't one of the claims sort of going to kind of what the corporation knew about the alleged defect in the product and the decision to recall and the related decision of whether to warn and all that. And isn't it plausible that Mr. Suzuki could know about those things? I mean, he certainly doesn't disclaim knowledge of it in the declaration. Your Honor, if we needed the president of a company to testify about the company's knowledge every time there was a case, then there would always be the president of the corporation being deposed. Right. And you need as a corporate representative. To right. In a pol as a policy matter, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. But I think that the 
and for, for better or worse, it seems like it seems like there's two paths that you have. One would be sort of a kind of addition to the normal rules of discovery in the form of an apex doctrine that would sort of say, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, if we just look sort of in the abstract at what you're allowed to discover and whatever, sure, you could go to the CEO, but we're going to say as a matter of law that essentially to cabin trial court discretion, they have to require parties to start somewhere else first. But if you're, but if we don't have that here yet, and if we're stuck with just sort of the basics of discovery, there's, even if there are better places to get the information, it doesn't seem like the rules require you to go to the best source of information from the get-go. I mean, or, or that the failure to require you to do so is, is necessarily an abuse of discretion. I mean, is that is that not a fair characterization of where we are? No, I don't think so, Your Honor, because in that event, then in Florida, a, a multinational corporation's president, CEO, chief operating officer would be deposed in just about every case because it's hard to believe they will not receive documents and just be informed FYI of things that are going on in the company without being directly involved in what's going on, without having any decision-making authority, what's going on. They just need to be informed about what's going on. And, and then that would just eviscerate any kind of protection that high level officials would have over depositions because you will always find a reason why a president uh, may have to be deposed, just like they did in this case. If you are correct, Your Honor, then maybe the president of General Star Insurance Company would have been deposed in that case. Here, we identified for them, um, and that's at RA 699-702, I think it was 24 different members of the Quality Countermeasure Committee over the tenure uh, that's relevant in this case, which is uh, roughly 2012 through 2013, uh, 17 members at any given time, they have never sought to examine any of the members of that committee. Uh, the people identified in the email, um, the email so, came from one I'm sorry, manager. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, if uh, One question I have is, uh, if, if we were to agree with the idea that it is sort of a per se abuse of discretion, um, to, to not have the apex doctrine in place, um, how broadly is, is it your position we should be adopting the rule? Is it to the singular CEO of the global enterprise? Or for example, of those 17 members on that committee, would any of them be covered by the apex doctrine in your estimation? Uh, they would not, Your Honor. I think that the apex doctrine traditionally has been applied to officers and directors of the company. So the, uh, the C blank O of the company, COO, CEO, CTO, CIO, um, the um, general counsel, members of the board of directors, the chairman of the board of directors. Um, I haven't seen it applied to anybody uh, other than that. And, and when you go below that, then they probably, it's likely that they would have knowledge, may have been directly involved. So I think the likelihood is much greater. Um, the way also that the court can adopt it, and which we, uh, which happened in this case and in the Atlantic hospitality case, is uh, the the proposed opponent or the party that uh, is contesting the deposition uh, must first come forward uh, with positive evidence that this official doesn't have knowledge, um, and then the um, the party seeking the deposition would have to show that this person has unique knowledge that nobody else has and that is necessary to prosecute the lawsuit. Um, it's like the argument that you're making about sort of the practicality. And again, I'm very sympathetic to it, but it seems like even if Mr. Suzuki remembered the memo, there would still probably be 500 other people at the company who would know a lot more and who you, as a matter of policy, you would want the uh, information seeker to depose first. So it just seems like what you're asking us to do, and, and again, and, and to, to Justice Coriel's question, it seems like the, the harder it is to even define what the apex doctrine is. I mean, obviously this would be an easy case if we had an apex doctrine because he is the, the CEO, but it seems like the more vague the rule itself is, the harder it is to say that it's a per se 
abuse of discretion not to follow a rule that we don't even that we, that, if you, that one can't even really clearly define. Well, and that's why uh, some of the cases from out of state that they have cited, while they do not adopt the apex doctrine per se, they still reversed orders requiring the deposition of the apex official under the circumstances of that case. And that's what the third DCA did in General Starr. That's what the first DCA did in the Haberger case with the um, university president. Um, and that's what this court can do is, and as I said, you don't have to adopt the apex doctrine. You can say that in this particular case, the uh, examination was not reasonably likely to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. And I see that I'm running into my rebuttal time. I know the chief justice is about to warn me. So thank you. And I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Council. Thank you. May it please the court. Shea Moxon on behalf of the respondent, Scott Winkler. Um, you know, I came prepared today, ready to start talking about jurisdiction, apex doctrine. Uh, but I find it interesting that the petitioner's argument skips right over all that and wants to go straight to asking this court to directly reviewing the trial judge's uh, discretionary decision on a discovery ruling where he weighed the evidence that was presented to him, uh, the documents, heard the arguments of uh, counsel, and he made a factual determination that this examination of Osama Suzuki is likely to lead to relevant evidence. As a matter of fact, he even found that he is uniquely able to provide relevant information. And so the whole- What's the, what's the, I mean, what would be the basis for thinking that he's quote unquote uniquely able? I mean, obviously everyone is, has unique information in the sense that they have their own sort of personal perspective, but it seems like there's enough in the record here to assume that, you know, he only would have the same sort of kind of observational type information that countless other people in the company would have. Um, well, as, as uh, your honor recognized earlier, this is, a, uh, this is a decision concerning whether and when to initiate a recall that was discussed at the highest level of the company. And so Judge Saud was considering what the email and memo showed and uh, conclude that uh, Mr. Suzuki was at least involved in this decision to initiate the recall. And so there is relevance beyond his mere status as a chairman. And uh, in some of the decisions that we decided like Bridgestone, Firestone, uh, Travelers v. Ford, uh, even in jurisdictions that apply some version of the apex doctrine, uh, when there are issues of knowledge or motives at the highest levels of the company, that's when it becomes appropriate to um, examine uh, top officials who may have knowledge about those matters. So given, given, given your failure though, to try to even try to get information from all these other people on this committee who would obviously have a lot more sort of useful facts for you and information to lead to other things. I mean, why wouldn't this be sort of the classic case where you could infer from your failure to do that, that really the only reason why you're so relentlessly pursuing this is because to, you know, to harass this, this potential deponent in the company. Well, Your Honor, the whole, that whole issue of whether we should have or why we didn't try to depose members of the committee, that was never developed out on the record. So I'm at a bit of a disadvantage to discussing that without going outside the record a little bit. And as a matter of fact, the claim that we didn't try to depose them, I mean, even that's not fully developed on the record. Uh, one interesting fact that I discovered um, preparing for this is that uh, Mr. Kudo, uh, whose deposition uh, Mr. Cantero was just discussing, in his deposition, which was taken, uh, the third volume, which was taken just a month before we initiated this process, he was asked, when did the quality uh, countermeasure committee, when did they first become informed of this? And his answer was October 11, 2013. That was the first time that committee knew about it. And so, and, that, so, and that's just uh, by way to show that uh, there's a lot of confusion about who we even would have known to depose. So at that point, this is um, just uh, 
about five months before a trial judge enters his order, we're being told by Mr. Kudo that, um, that uh, this committee didn't even know about this break problem at the time. So th there's just one fact in the whole picture of it. Uh, my understanding is that um, there are discussions between counsel uh, behind the scenes and we were led to believe that Suzuki was not going to consent to any deposition taken through the normal process at the embassy unless it was a corporate representative deposition. Uh, you tie that all in with the fact that it, any deposition taken in Japan takes months to set up, um, costs many thousands of dollars. It could run up to about $10,000 per deposition. Uh, the, you know, all the burdens are discussed in the two cases I cited, J.C. Renfro and Sons and um, uh, the Shaw order from November 17th, or excuse me, November of 2017. Um, all just to say that uh, you know there's a very complex factual and procedural background to this. So um, one of the reasons I've asked the court to discharge jurisdiction is because this is such an unusual case where we don't have normal deposition procedures where anyone can just issue a notice and then the CEO either has to sit for deposition or there's a protective order, and uh, and then uh, you know trial judge can say, well, why don't you just depose? some of these other people first and you say okay i go do that I mean, that's completely impractical here where every single deposition is uh going to have to go through letter rogatory uh you know there's going to be fights over the translation of their letter rogatory that that's going on now as suzuki pointed out in their reply brief uh things have to be set up months in advance and uh you know if we had a whole hearing where we could have uh, developed, uh, you know, an answer to this question. Well, why haven't you done uh, some quality control countermeasure committee depots first? Uh, you know, we'd have a whole record about that. But, uh, you know, I'm asking the court to step back, though, and look, what is its role here? Uh, this is where I started out with. Um, Suzuki is asking this court to step in and directly review Judge Saud's finding of rel relevance based on uh, you know, based on the factual background of this case and the information, the evidence he was presented with, uh, Judge Saud drew his, inf uh, you know, he reached his conclusion that uh, there's, there's relevant material information to be had here, and Suzuki disagrees with it because they think other evidence points in the other direction. That, that respectfully is not what this court is here for. To, that review was already held by the first district when they, uh, considered uh, Suzuki's petition for certiorari and concluded that uh, there's no departure from the essential of the re requirements of the law. Well, but they're also asking us to try to lend some coherence to Florida law overall, which is our role. And why should the, you know, the head of DBPR have more protection from a potentially, you know, harassing deposition request than, you know, the CEO of a company like this? I mean, it doesn't, it does seem, so could you address that? I mean, so obviously the cases have talked about government agency heads, but in terms of the underlying principles uh, that led to that, to, to the development of that doctrine, it seems like it would be hard to argue that those same principles don't apply in this context. Well, there are two key distinctions in the government context. Uh, first is that the decisions that adopted this uh, the a variant of the apex doctrine in the corporate context, or excuse me, government context, were driven largely by concerns for separation of powers. Uh, Isn't going back, that really, though, more relevant to what that courts talk about that in the context of the types of questions that can be asked in sort of discretionary government decisions? But it seems like the core of the doctrine originated with the idea that, you know, if you just literally look at our discovery rules, you could theoretically come up with some reason why you could depose an agency head for pretty much anything that's going on in the agency. And it seems like, as your colleague on the other side was saying, you know, the same argument is, you know, what kind of what, like what you're making in, in this case in the corporate context. Well, um, respectfully, Justice Muniz, I have to disagree. There is actually, I, I reviewed all the government apex cases recently, and there's not one mention of any rules of discovery in there that I could see. Uh, just maybe a casual mention that somebody moved for a protective order. Now, the doctrine originated with 
out of concern for the separation of powers. Uh, going back to the HRS versus Brooke case, uh, 573 something second, 363. That case was addressing more trial testimony, but then in later decisions, um, uh, the first district uh, applied the same principles to depositions. And again, it was same, uh, same concern, largely driven by a concern for deposition, uh, separation of powers where agency heads were being brought in to ask to explain uh, their reasoning behind de discretionary decisions or how they would have behave, uh, ruled in uh, hypothetical situations. So there's a separation of powers concern that that's not present in the corporate context. And then there's also a public policy matter, which is that uh, those cases are all driven by um, also by a concern that if agency heads are subjected to too many depositions, that it would deter qualified people from wanting to seek those positions in government. Well, there's no public policy that drives courts to try to encourage employment as heads of, uh, of private corporations. That public policy concern just isn't here. And that's one of the reasons why um, the Citigroup case and Florida Office of Insurance Regulation said that, uh, that the private context is distinguishable, that we don't have that public policy concern. Well, that's pretty, I mean, I think, you know, look, I, I think the, the more you talk policy, the weaker your position is. I mean, I think, I think sticking to sort of the black letter existing laws, I mean, because it's really, in, it seems indefensible that you could have sort of one policy for an agency here and a, and a, a policy that acts like we should be indifferent to, you know, potential, you know, harassment of people who are, you know, similarly potentially involved in everything that goes on, you know, literally in this case all over the world. Well, I, I can only offer why those courts adopted that government uh, apex uh, rule, which has never been before this court, before this court has never really weighed in on that, whether that was correct law in the first place. But those, those uh, government context cases, they're not based on any rules of procedure. Their origin are in the separation of policy, powers concerns and this public policy of encouraging employment, neither of which applies here. What we do have in the corporate context, the private context, we have a set of rules that there's absolutely no way to discern in the text of any of these rules any basis to give special treatment to top officers of corporations when somebody wants to take their deposition. There's nothing in there that puts any burden on the person seeking their deposition to have to make this unique showing that the deponent will have unique knowledge that nobody else has and that they've exhausted every other source of discovery. Uh, it, you know, the version of the doctrine that uh, is phrased in this question, it would require exhaustion of all other discovery, even if the uh, apex official has unique knowledge, which, you know, doesn't make sense. If it's unique knowledge, then why exhaust everything else? But um, <clears throat> so, you know, there's no basis in the rules. And um, really, this doctrine is unnecessary. Um, yeah, I, at one point where I think I, we agree with Suzuki is that existing rules are sufficient to address this this supposed problem, if it really is a problem, of uh, potentially harassing depositions of uh, CEOs and chairmen of the board. We just disagree on how that applies to the facts here. So, so my point being is that the rules, the current rules provide trial courts with all the tools they need to prevent harassing depositions and to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, the wheels of commerce aren't gonna be ground to a halt by, uh, calling every CEO and chairman in to sit for deposition over and over and, uh, and to make sure that the depositions are going to be reasonably calculated to lead to admissible evidence. But so isn't, 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 aren't the facts here sort of the poster child for why maybe there should be more guidance for trial courts? Because really, it seems like the only thing that you're hanging your hat on for why there should be a deposition here is this, you know, the fact that this piece of paper was shown to this guy who probably sees a gazillion of these memos. And so there's nothing, you know, so to the extent that our, that there's nothing in our rules that, that prevent that, then it seems like maybe there does, there does need to be more, more meat on the bone of what the rules are. 
Well, it, it wasn't just that it was shown to him, but it was discussed with him. It was discussed with him and reading the email afterwards, the email indicates that uh, the, 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 the managers involved with that document were apparently needing his signature for whatever purpose. Uh, you know, the email says, Today, when I handed the background material for the senior managing officer, the senior managing officer explained it to the chairman, came back with the chairman's signature. I'm sending the material with the signature. So they were waiting for his signature. Um, you know, despite what he says about not having authority to approve it, uh, it really doesn't stand to reason that uh, whatever he might have thought or said when he reviewed this, that that would be ignored by the company. Uh, and it would certainly uh, have weighed at trial. But uh, again, you know, I want the court to step back and, you know, this evidence, it was weighed by the trial judge. He made this ruling, it's a discretionary ruling and it's already been reviewed, reviewed once by the first district court of appeal that found no uh, departure from the essential requirements of the law. And so how does this case get up to this court? Well, um, they certified this question of great public importance, but, the question that Suzuki would like that to be, whether this court should adopt the apex doctrine, that's not a question that the first district ever passed upon. So, so uh, you know, it's a fundamental principle of uh, this court's jurisdiction under Article 5, 3, B, 4. It doesn't have jurisdiction to answer questions that were never passed upon by the district court. And so here, the first district, they never, uh, weighed the pros and cons of extending the apex doctrine to the corporate side, never canvas, uh, you know, the cases around the, around the country from different states, some adopting, some rejecting, examine whether it's consistent with the rules. So that question that um, Suzuki was, um, you know, has been asking this court to answer until they seem to change course today, you know, that whether this doctrine should be adopted by this court, that's not a question that was ever passed upon by the first district. And so- uh, Judge Thomas spent some time talking about it, didn't he? Um, well, he certainly did, but uh, a dissent is not, um, yes, he did, but the, 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 right, but the court has to look to the majority opinion because the court reviews the decision that passes upon a question certified by it to be of great public importance. So and in this it case, has to be no passed question. upon by the In this case, there's no question the court passed upon the question that it certified, which is, is it a departure from the essential requirements of law, you know, dot, dot, dot. So that means that's the gateway to jurisdiction. And now your colleague on the other side has asked us to review the decision. And we're being asked to decide, is it, a, is it a departure from the essential requirements of law? And it sounds like he's, he's basing his argument on some you know, broader principles here that at least there is some hook in existing Florida law. So I, I don't think that it's, I don't think that regardless of how we should answer the question, it doesn't seem like it's not properly before the court. Well, I, I submit that the question of whether this doctrine should be adopted is not properly before the court. What the First district. It'd be helpful if I unmute. Uh, where in the question, counsel, is the word should? It's not in there, and, and that's that's my point. Uh, that the well, but this is, they're asking us. They they just they made a decision that uh, there was not a violation of the essential requirements of law. And they're asking us to address that same question, whether they were right or wrong on that question that they address. I mean, I, you know, whether would this case ought to be discharged on up for some other reason, that's a, that's a different question. But um, on that, uh, I, just how that how they didn't pass on what they've actually asked here, I'm I'm, I'm mystified by that. Uh, yes, uh, that actually wasn't what I was arguing. Um, what they actually wrote, what the certified question actually asked and what they passed upon is whether the apex doctrine is currently law. Everyone in the corporate context, everyone agrees that it isn't. Suzuki agreed that it isn't at page three of the reply brief. 
And so looking at it that way, it's a very simple matter. You can either discharge jurisdiction because it's already settled and you don't even need to answer it, or you can just say, um, no, it's not currently law in the corporate context. And so there's no departure from the central requirements of law and failing to apply it. You did the right thing, first district, by denying certiorari because there was no violation of a clearly established principle of law. There, there's definitely no clearly established law extending this very rigid apex rule to the corporate context. It's been either rejected or de declined to be applied in every district court decision that's ever looked at the question. And uh, I, I know I'm running low on time, but uh, just to sum up, um, uh, we maintain there's no jurisdiction to answer the should question because that was never passed upon. Uh, beyond that, this is the wrong case because of the unusual procedures and the uh, specific factual context to really decide whether uh, the apex doctrine should be adopted. The doctrine is unnecessary because current rules already give trial judges enough discretion to deal with any problem of potentially harassing de depositions when they arise. And um, if the court were to consider whether to adopt this very rigid rule that greatly limits uh, discovery in every case involving corporate policies, that would best be done in a rule proceeding. And uh, so in conclusion, we're asking the court to discharge jurisdiction. Uh, failing that, it should answer the certified question in the negative and approve the first district's opinion. Decision denying certiorari. Thank you, counsel. Now for rebuttal argument. Um, perhaps working my way backward, uh, unless the court has any questions. As to the certified question, the first certified question asks, does a trial court depart from the essential requirements of law by not requiring a party seeking to depose the top officer of a corporation to show that one, other means of discovery have been exhausted, and two, the corporate officer is uniquely able to provide relevant information that cannot be obtained from other sources? Uh, there can be no question that both the majority and the dissent address that issue. That was the whole point of the majority and dissenting opinions. Um, so I don't think there's any question that the court does have discretionary jurisdiction. Um, and I also submit that the court should retain jurisdiction and answer the question or any rephrased question uh, because of the policy issues involved and, uh, and to eliminate any incongruity between the protections that an apex public official receives and, an apex, and that, that an apex private official receives. Um, let us remember that as far as public officials, their, their role is important, but it's restricted to the state of Florida. For apex officials in the private corporations, as is the case here, their influence is worldwide. Um, Suzuki operates in many parts of the world. And so the, I, I submit that the state should protect those officials at least as much as it protects public officials. So that's a reason to retain the case. On the merits, uh, I'd like to address uh, Judge Muniz, you uh, referred to the black letter law. We have rule 1.280B1, I believe it is, which requires that the discovery be relevant or reasonably likely to lead to the discovery of relevant information. This court and other courts have routinely, historically, traditionally reviewed discovery orders on that basis. It quashes discovery orders regardless of whether there was already a case on point. In the discovery context, if you need there to be a prior case, you probably would not decide 90% of discovery petitions for certiorari because they always involve unique, new, factual circumstances. And so the courts do not say, you know, is there established law on point? Um, in which case, rarely will a tri ju trial judge violate it. Um, it asks, I, I'm I understand what you're saying, but it seems like we either, 
you know, in order to sort of justify our kind of intervening here, you can imagine a quote unquote adopting a, an apex rule, which is sort of a, you know, kind of an, a, it would be essentially a new rule. Or if we're really just, if we really were just going to say that, you know, given, you know, this declaration and what, you know, the corporate rep in this case said that, you know, this particular person's deposition you know, there, there wasn't enough there to conclude that it would reasonably lead to the discovery of admission, admissible evidence. I mean, that would be, I mean, would you agree that that would be kind of an odd thing for this court to be getting, to be essentially issuing a micro ruling on something like that? It is unusual, but not unprecedented. And I, I submit that that's exactly what this court did in Allstate versus Langston. Um, it's kind of what it did in Elkin versus Sykin, where it adopted the third DCA's uh, eight point plan, so to speak, for getting a financial discovery and other discovery from experts in a case. That was a case of first impression here. Um, but I think more broadly, uh, the court should, um, should clarify, is there an apex doctrine in Florida? Because courts are applying it to public officials. And if there's an apex doctrine, should it apply both to public and private officials? Um, I don't think the court should, uh, I think it has the opportunity. But, but, but you, you concede, counsel, that if we make that declaration, it will be of uh, uh, the existence of a um, an apex doctrine that applies in the corporate context. That will be newly discovered. It will be something that we have just discovered in this case. Well, I, I don't think it's in a sense it's newly discovered. Um, I, I understand what your point is, but it's the application of the rules of procedure. The um, rule 1.280B1 and rule 1.280C, which allows courts to issue orders to prevent annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, or undue burden or expense to particular uh, facts that may arise and standardize the process like this court did in Sykin versus Elkin. So um, I, I don't think it's, it's new, but to the extent it is, it's certainly not unprecedented that this court creates new standards when a, when a case first appears before it. It's done it before us, as, as I, as we said in our brief uh, with Tucker versus Russia, with Sykin versus Elkin. Um, well, it just seems like, it, it seems to me, and I, I'll say this, that it's, it's kind of an odd thing to have a newly discovered, clearly established principle of law. Well, the clearly established principle, Your Honor, um, is, is the rule itself that pro prohibits um, discovery that is not reasonably likely to lead to discovery of admissible evidence. And that's now, what- I, I apologize for uh, talking to you here and once your rebuttal time is over, could you get some up about uh, 30 seconds? Certainly, Your Honor. Um, thank you for the indulgence. We, we submit that the court, whether or not it adopts the Apex Doctrine should quash the decision of the District Court of Appeal and hold that either under the circumstances of this particular case or in other circumstances that the deposition of or examination of an apex official uh, should not be taken um, until the party can show that only that official has unique knowledge that is unavailable from other officials. Um, thank you very much for your time. All right, we thank you both for your arguments.